nations reason to celebrate on the day Life can be very daily, and um, stuff out there, work, school, whatever you're involved in, can sometimes feel like a grind. And so just to take a moment out and be here together, I just want to remind us that we're here to worship. We're here to enter into God's presence and to experience Him this morning. And just to remind you that if you want to partake in communion, we have those stations up front. We also have an area for prayer in the back, but I want to encourage our hearts just to enter in with an attitude and a heart of worship. Even as we sing Christmas songs, it's the message and it's the one that we're singing to this morning. Son 
Preparing for this morning's service this week, I was reminded and thinking about just this Christmas season. And I'm one of those crazy Christmas fanatics. I love the Christmas season, by far my favorite holiday of the year. But I realized that not everyone necessarily feels that way. And as I was thinking about Christmas in this season, that it is one of those polarizing kinds of times of the year because there's such beauty and joy and, and high, strong, positive emotion attached to this season, but there's equally difficult, painful ones for many as well. And this season just seems to bring that out and heighten it. And as I was thinking about that, I was drawn to the very basic foundational truth that whether we're on a high or whether we're experiencing pain, a low or challenge, that it all comes back to one simple truth and that wherever we're at, we need Jesus. That whether we're on a high, we need to praise him. We need to give him our thanks because what we have is from him. Or whether we're being challenged or going through something difficult or painful, we need him because he's our hope. And so this morning, I wanted to encourage us that he is the one that we would bring it to. And there is power in just the name of Jesus. Jesus. 
to die when I come to die give me Jesus Jesus, that you alone are the one that can fill that need within us, whether it's a physical thing, whether it's an emotional thing, whether it's mental, spiritual, God, we need you. Jesus, we thank you for the love that you gave us on that cross when you died for us. And I pray this morning that we would experience you, Jesus, and your power and the hope that you alone can give us, that this morning that we would receive that in whatever way we need. We pray in Jesus' name. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written a Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken it. Shut it. 
came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on do you believe that sing it out then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me oh, jesus yours is the You may be seated. Uh, my name is Laura, and I serve on the First Impressions team as one of your greeters every Sunday. And I'm Chandler, and I'm a student in student ministries. And we just want to take a few minutes and welcome you here this Sunday, whether you're a first-time guest or you've been returning every week. Um, we're so glad that you're spending part of your Sunday with us. Also, Christmas is coming just a couple weeks away. Who's excited about that? Yeah. And this year at LifePoint, we have seven services. Chandler, how many? Seven. Seven of them. Seven opportunities for you to invite your family, your friends, your coworkers to join us. Uh, yeah, just one on the ground there. But that little card is inside your program. If you would take that and intentionally invite people to join us, that would be awesome. And because we have how many services? Seven. We need your help with those seven services. Um, I enjoy on Christmas serving in the greeters, of course, being able to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and say hello to them. Chandler, where do you like to serve? I like baking cookies with Miss Jane. Who wouldn't? I mean, yummy. So if you would like to do cookies or greet or there is an array of other things, if you were willing to serve, if you could fill out the I Serve flyer that's also in your program. And Nicole is waiting across from the Connection Center today. If you would take that to her, she will get you all signed up. And that's it for us. Would you like to welcome the guest? Please welcome Pastor Kyle Baker. Good job, man. If only I knew how many services there were. I mean, that's just not been clear the whole time. Seven. <laughs> hey, my name is Kyle. Good to be here with you today. Um, we don't know each other yet, um, but I'd like to get to know you. And have you ever noticed that when you get to know someone, like you, you, make, you make some chit-chat, kind of like we're doing now, and then you get to a question that but pretty much everyone asks, is that what do you do? Have you ever gotten that before? Like you get to that point. And my favorite is telling that I'm, that I'm a pastor. Like that's just, the facial expressions are just awesome. Like people are replaying the conversation, like did I cuss in front of this guy? Like... <laughs> And sometimes they snap out of it and they go, you're a pastor? Oh, shout for joy. That's fantastic. <laughs> for you. For you. That's great. Um, but my favorite part uh, is uh, they, they have some questions. And, and this is just my favorite part. I don't know why this happens. These questions are all authentic. I can't make this up. Um, they asked me all these fantastic questions. And I was like, that's, that's the thing that you really want to know. So one of my family members one time when they realized I was becoming a pastor, they said, hey, 
do you have to wear robes all the time? I was like, robes? And they're like, you know the hat? I was like, that's a priest. I'm a pastor. We wear skinny jeans, okay? That's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do, right? And then another time, this person, they said, hey, I really want to know this. This is a serious question. They actually asked this to me. They said, does holy water work on vampires? And I was like, okay, that's what you want to know, the one question. Like, that's ridiculous. Of course it does. Like, duh. Like, of course it does. Like, if you have that problem, call me up. I'll come bless the water. You'll be fine. You'll be totally fine. And then one time, uh, and this is one I get all the time, but people ask, hey, how do you get to heaven? Which is, which is a really serious question question and, and something that kind of maybe pastors have that job to point people out and how to do that. And usually I ask them the same question, are you a cat person? And they say, no. I'm like, you're halfway there. You're fine. You're totally fine. And the people who don't laugh at that joke, those are cat people. And now that I know where you are, I will avoid you because I'm allergic. I apologize. But one of the other things that happens, and, and I'm so sad that this is, this is part of the equation, is that sometimes is that when people learn that I'm a pastor, you know, they start to make comments. And I hear this all the time. I say, hey, you know, you, know, you must be really close to God, cl closer than I am. Or, you know, because you work at a church or because you're a pastor, you know, God listens to you in ways that he would never listen to me. Or you just must be a better person. Ask my wife. Trust me, it's not true, right? It is just not true. We have no moral high ground to stand on. We're not better people. And we're going to talk about how that comes about today. But we have no moral high ground. We're not any better. In fact, I would love to share just a personal story to kind of cement this. Is that, and I wish this was like way back when, when I wasn't a Christian, when I wasn't a pastor, but this is in the last year or so, is that I had a conversation with someone who was really, really important to me, um, and we had been saying some hurtful things, more so on their end than my end, uh, and they had been continuing to just kind of like say and do things that were just inappropriate. I did not approve of what they were doing. And then finally, I, I just lost it. Have you ever done that? Like you just lose it. If you have kids, you know exactly what that means. <laughs> You just lose it. And so I, I lost all of my filters. I think I lost my, my salvation. I don't know what happened, but I talked to them in this, and I said some really hurtful, intentional things back to them in this phone conversation. And I would love to say that the Christian part of me kicked in, or maybe the pastoral part, and I said, hey, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Can we move forward? I didn't do that. We both hung up the phone after saying some bad things to one another, and we left the relationship in un certainty. Have you ever done that before? It's hard. And I think what happens in this place, and the reason that we're both uncertain about our relationship is because we get two things mixed up that we should never get mixed up. And I'm going to tell you what those are in a second. Last week, Pastor Scott told us about the gift of life, that God gives us the gift of life. And today, I'm going to talk about the gift of forgiveness and acceptance, which for many of you in the middle and even at the end of this message, it's going to be hard for you to hand this out. I'm just telling you that up front. But today, we're going to talk about the gift of acceptance and forgiveness. So what is the problem? Here's, here's the question we think. What's the difference between approval and acceptance? You ever thought about that? Because we should never equate these two things. And I have absolutely done that. In fact, in my relationship that I was just talking about, <clears throat> my acceptance of this person was based on my approval of what they did. I said, I will reject you out of my life because you've said and done some things that I wholeheartedly reject, so I reject you. So what's the difference between these two? Well, there are simple definitions for them. Approval is based on what you do. If you're a fill-in-the-blank person, it is approval is based on what you do. When you base a relationship based on approval, it will only be as good as the last good thing that they said to you, and it will only be as bad as the last bad thing that they said or did to you. A relationship that is based on approval, you never know if it's going to be there or not. We should never base our relationships on this. And then the second way, and what we're going to talk about today, is acceptance. And acceptance is based on who you are. Acceptance in a relationship says, even though you may have done something bad to me, even though you might have said something, our relationship is not based on your actions, it's based on who you are to me. Sometimes this means a spouse, sometimes this means a friend, sometimes it might be a family member, sometimes it might be a coworker. But you say that the basis of a relationship is based on who you are to me. Now what this does not say is it gives people freedom to hurt you over and over and over again. That is not what it is. 
But what it is, is a basis of relationship that allows you to accept someone based on who they are, not what they have done. And most of us would love that because we unintentionally and sometimes intentionally hurt people as well. Now, in my story, have you ever done this? When I'm thinking about the story that I just shared, have you ever played those conversations again and again later on? Have you ever done that? Where like someone has said horrible things to you and you can't get it off your mind and whether you're at work or at home, you're distracted, you're replaying that conversation in your head. And I don't know, this is, maybe this is just me. Like I forget all the bad stuff that I said and I just concentrate on what they said. Have you ever done that? And, and they just become horrible. Like they become this like ogre of a person and you're like cowering. It's horrible. Now, I don't know if you do this. This is how I've chosen to do it. I'm a little older, a little wiser. I've started to add people into the background to these imaginary conversations. Have you ever done that? Because I want others to hear how horrible they were to me, right? And then they just kind of let me have it. And finally, when it's my turn to talk, I'm like this righteous person. The sun is shining behind me. I've got like a sword in my hand and something. And I'm so righteous. And I want people to go, oh, yeah, he's letting them have it, right? I don't know if you've ever done that. If you do, if you don't, don't. It's horrible. Don't do that. But what's interesting about these imaginary conversations, and we're going to look into an imaginary conversation that Peter has with himself that kind of sets off this trajectory for what we're going to talk about today. So what's happening here, this is Matthew 18, in case you guys are wondering where in the Bible, it's in Matthew 18, is that Jesus has been gathering followers for a while now because he is just the master teacher. He's been teaching all over the place. He's been traveling, and he's been teaching, and people have kind of tuned in to what he's been saying. And because he is one who is described as one who teaches with authority, people have followed him around because they want to hear what he has to say. And so Jesus has been teaching a bunch. There are crowds that are following him. And then there's kind of this inner circle called disciples, this followers of Jesus, who he just kind of said, I accept you into my life, kind of an inner core. And they've all been watching him, and they've been listening to him. And so he's been traveling and teaching and feeding and doing some incredible things. And before the context of our story, Jesus had just finished teaching on conflict. He said, hey, if something happens, this is what you should do. And so Peter is off on his own. And he's having this replay of this imaginary conversation that has happened before. He's picturing someone, probably, we think, who has hurt him before. Jesus finishes teaching on conflict, and Peter kind of approaches him because, you know, he's one of Jesus' good friends, and he asks a question. And he kind of says, hey, hey, Jesus, you know, hypothetically speaking, if someone were to hurt someone, let's say Matthew and Mark, let's say they get into an argument, one of them hurts the other one, like hypothetically speaking, how many times, you know, do you forgive asking for a friend? How many times do you have to forgive? That's the question that he asked Jesus. How many times is it? How many times is too much? How much hurt is too much? How much will I approve of before I get to reject them? And before he gives Jesus an answer, or or give opportunity to answer, he answers the question himself. He says, is it seven times? I mean, seven just seems like a round, awesome number. I know if it was only seven times, I could go through that in like a day. There's no way that seven times is enough. But that's the reason that he asked. He says, look, this is a holy, round, religious, good-sounding number, Jesus. Is it seven times? And Jesus replies. He says this. He says, it's not seven times, but 77 times. In fact, in another translation, it says 70 times 7. I went to Bible college, so I'm not a math major, but I know that's just shy of 500. It's way up there. And in fact, Jesus, and we don't know exactly every word he said, but Jesus might have been like, Peter, are you, are you serious? Like, you're keeping count? Like, that's approval, thinking Peter. If you're basing it on what they have done to you, and you have a tally sheet, you have missed what forgiveness is about completely. Because forgiveness has nothing to do with the amount of times that they have hurt you. It's whether or not you have accepted them into your life or not. And Peter says, really, if if this person is important enough to ask me this question, and you're going to count about it, that's approval thinking, Peter. We want to go with acceptance. And so Peter thinks he's done. Hey, he's given me a number. This is great. And then Jesus goes off and he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like, and Peter's probably like, here we go, right? I just wanted a number, a single sentence, like that we could all walk away. And, Peter, and Peter's probably like, here he goes. He's just going to go into this story. And Jesus kind of does that. He says, hey, everyone, kind of teaching moment. Come on, let's, let's come in here. And so he gathers everyone around. It's story time. The disciples are there. He gathers them into 
Because Jesus knows that this topic of forgiveness is too important to give a one-sentence answer to. There's just no way you can do that. And so Jesus says, this is a teaching moment. I want to let you know how important this is to me. And I'm going to tell you a story. And so he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, if you're not familiar with that phrase, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven more than anything. If you were to read through the New Testament uh, on these eyewitness accounts of people who walked around with Jesus and wrote down what he said, this was on the lips of Jesus more than anything else. And it's kind of a technical term, but in simplest terms, what it means is, is that if you were to gather up a bunch of people who say, I am a Christian, I follow Jesus, I do what he says over what I say, God is my king, that's what a kingdom of heaven would look like. It's a bunch of people who have said yes to God over yes to themselves. And so what's interesting about this is, is Jesus realized there's a mixture of people out there just like there are a mixture of people in here. There are people who have absolutely said yes and are followers of Jesus, and Jesus says, you guys need to listen up because this is absolutely for you. Now, if you're, if you're here today and, you know, you maybe you thought this was McDonald's and you're here and you're like, I just can't leave at this point, like, we're glad you're here today. And so if you're not a Christian, you get to sit back. You get to sit back. There is no pressure on you. I'm not going to ask a thing from you today. Because Jesus is directing this at people who say that they follow him. Now, I think the points that we're going to go through today would be absolutely helpful to you in your life. And I encourage you to try them. But Jesus is saying, if you say you follow me, I'm going to have some expectation on a group of people who say that. So here he goes. He launches into his story. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began this settlement, a man, a servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, was brought to him. It's a large sum. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Merry Christmas. That's horrible, right? Aren't you glad you came to church today? It's horrible. He said, look, you owe me so much, and you're not going to be able to pay it back, so you and your whole family go to prison. Now, what's fascinating about this is Jesus is just the master teacher. There's a reason people followed him from all over the place. They traveled from tons of different cities to hear him teach because he is the master. And what's interesting about this is Jesus could have used any sort of literary device, any analogy, any physical object, any relationship to describe what it's like when someone hurts you so bad that it requires forgiveness. And what is the thing that Jesus chooses to highlight this? It's money. And I think there's a reason behind this. When we have been hurt so bad, what kind of language do we use? You took something from me. You could never pay me back for what you did to me. I hope you get payback or what's coming to you. I mean, Jesus understands this dynamic. He says that when you are hurt to a degree that forgiveness is required, there is a debt that is owed. And Peter and the people who are listening on this story like this story so far because they understand that this is a large sum of money. And so Jesus continues because Peter's leaning in. He's like, yeah, I I think I'm the king. We would probably put ourselves in that position. We would say, look, we're the one who has been hurt to an immeasurable degree, degree, that forgiveness seems like a million miles away. So Peter and everyone else leans in. Jesus continues the story. He says that this, the servant fell on his knees and he says, be patient with me. He begged, just be patient and I will pay back everything. And at this point, people who are listening to the story, they, they just laugh. I mean, we don't, we don't understand this, but the amount that the servant owed, if he were to divide an average day worker's wage into what he owed, you know how long it would be? Not 20 years? Not 200 years, not 2,000 years, not 20,000 years, 200,000 years of labor. That's how much this guy owed. So when he says, just give me time, unless you have immortality too, there's no way that that's possible. So everyone laughed. The purpose isn't the sum though. The purpose is it is unrepayable. The debt is unrepayable. And Jesus continues, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. And then he lands the punchline that no one sees coming. He says, the servant's master, the king, took pity on him. And he canceled the debt, let him go. This was a costly move. I mean, if it's 200,000 years worth of debt, it's not like the king's like, "Ah, we'll make it up on Wednesday, don't worry about that. 
It's, it's a, a huge thing that costs the king personally. And everyone's ears perked up at this point because they're waiting for the punchline to go, yeah, that guy deserves jail. We have been hurt. Have justice be served. Throw them all in there. I don't care how cute their kids are. Get in there, right? He's saying that there is absolutely something that must be done because the debt is too high. And Peter's leaning into this. And he's like, okay, this is not where I saw this story going. But you got to remember, this, this whole story is in the context of a relationship. Jesus is trying to highlight the pain that someone feels when someone has wronged them, whether intentionally or not. And Peter understands the irrepayable part. Peter understands that Jesus needs to be, that the justice needs to be done. But the part of him that's like, you just got to let him go. Man, that's a difficult one for me. But here, I think, is what he's essentially saying, because... And this is going to be your first fill in here. His forgiveness is canceling your right to hurt someone who has hurt you. Here's the interesting thing about this story Jesus doesn't ask them to forget. Have you ever heard that before? In order to forgive someone, you need to forget, which makes no sense. One, there are some pains I will never forget in my entire life. And two, you can only forgive something that you remember, right? If you just forget about it, it's absent mindedness, it's not forgiveness. And so Jesus is saying, look, you will never forget what they have done to you. But you can choose to cancel your right to hurt them. And what I love about that, the reason I have phrased it this way, is that because Jesus is acknowledging that there is absolutely a debt. He's not glossing over that and giving fluff over there. He's saying, look, you have absolutely been hurt. And in everyday occurrence, no one would look Twice, if you gave them justice and hurt them right back. In fact, some of your friends would probably cheer you on, to be honest. Some friends and family members would say, they have hurt you so deeply, any opportunity you can do to do that back to them, do it. But here's what happens. Here's why everyone perked up their heads in this story, and maybe you do too, is that because forgiveness is what people do not expect. They expect justice. And what we all need to understand, and this is so powerful, and this is, Jesus is going to get here, but the deeper the hurt, the more powerful the forgiveness, isn't it? People know that. What kind of stories make the news? The person who has forgiven someone, not the person who has given justice. Jesus is highlighting this is a powerful relationship tool. And Peter's probably fine, like, all right, fine, I get it. I thought this was, story, this was a story about justice, I get it. This is a story about forgiveness. I'm the king of the story. My job, no matter how big of a debt, I have the power to cancel it. I'll do it, Jesus. Let's break for lunch. But Jesus is not done. He continues his story. Verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants. So the first guy that has been healed, excuse me, forgiven of everything and has inward healing because he doesn't have this huge debt over his shoulder, he goes out and he finds someone else. He finds one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which is about three months' wage. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. I love that this is in the Bible. I mean, this is fun, right? It's not like verbal abuse. He's like, he's choking him out there, right? I was like, man, that's kind of harsh. Like, just like insult his mom or something like that. Just like, don't choke him. That's horrible. And so he began to choke him and he says, pay back what you owe me. And he demanded this. And then his fellow servant fell to his knees and he began to beg him. He says, be patient with me. And I will pay it all back. Now at this point, it sounds repetitive. Because if you've been paying attention, this is the same line that the first servant used with the king. It's the exact same line. And Jesus is contrasting two very different stories here in the same story. In the first instance, the first servant had no ability to pay back the debt that he owes. It was unpayable. And in the second scenario, it's absolutely repayable. Three months, this guy would have been out of debt. And Jesus highlights the forgiveness that was shown to the first person should have been easy to show to the second. But that's not what happened. And the people who are listening to this story, and, and maybe you, get a knot in their stomach around this time. They realized that maybe this story isn't going in their direction. Peter probably realized, I'm not, I don't think I'm the king 
in this story. So Jesus continues. But he refused. The first servant refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. But the problem is there were other servants in Jesus' story that, that were watching this happen because they had been there when the king had forgiven the first servant. And so what they do? They went off and they saw. They were outraged. They told their master, another word for the king, everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in and he says, you wicked servant. And he gives him a title at this point, the worst title that you can have. Not only are you a servant at this point, you are a wicked servant. The king is angry. And he says so. He says, look, I canceled all of the debt that you had because you begged me to do it. I had every right to throw you and your whole family in jail. There was this unpayable debt. You could do nothing, and I had mercy on you, and I forgave you, and everyone watched that. Shouldn't you, and this is just such a line that just haunts us, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Your debt, totally unrepayable. I said it was done. This servant who owed you, totally repayable, you threw him into prison. And then he says this last line. He says, in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And Peter's like, Ew. this is a tough one. Because Peter at this time finally realized, he said, every, every time he's been saying this story, I've been thinking that I am the king, that I have been incredibly wrong at this point. Peter realized this story isn't going in his direction because Peter's not the king in this story. Now, Jesus is absolutely saying that this is about relationships horizontally between us, our friends, our family members, the people we care about. But Jesus is about to take this conversation. It's the reason he tells this story. He said it is not just about your horizontal relationships with people. It is not just about the debt that they owe you or that you owe someone else. There is a deeper part of this story that Jesus wants everyone listening, and by extension us, because we get to read this story now, to understand he says this in 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat you, each of you, unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. End of parable. Peter's just sorry he asked a question at this point, right? He's just so sorry. He's like, I should have asked like how to walk on water or something like that. That would have been easier. Like this is so difficult and uncomfortable. And if you're a Christian, you look at these words and you think, I'm not sure I've ever read that before. Or if I have, I skip over it. Or I wish they weren't on the lips of Jesus in the Bible because I'm so used to happy-go-lucky Jesus that just forgives everybody and it's fantastic. But here, here he says, your heavenly father, your God, Peter, and everyone listening, he will treat you that way. And it's haunting for everybody to hear. Now, this is, this is a difficult story to hear. I'm going to sit down for a second. The reason that I have the confidence to share this with you, one, because Jesus is saying it, so all the pressure's off me. He's the one saying it. But here's the practical part of this. Yeah. You know, be, not necessarily because I'm a pastor, but I'm going to say this is an opportunity. One of the opportunities I get as a pastor is that I feel like a safe place for some people, and they come and tell me stuff that they would never tell anybody else. I've had people in my office, in my home, say things like, a family member sexually molested me. I trusted them. There will never be a repayment for that that will always define our relationship. Or, I cheated on my wife. The pain that I have caused her, she's taken the kids, she's gone. It was a mistake of mine, I understand. I own it. But the pain that I have caused her, there's, there's not going to be forgiveness there. I've worked with people who've made some decisions, or I've been in a group of friends who have done something that I don't approve of, and I'm sitting in this awkward place, and I don't know where to get to, and I think I need to extend some forgiveness, but the pain is too hard. It would be so insensitive of me to just say, you just need to forgive them. I would never do that. But the reason I feel confident in sharing this story is for two reasons. The first one is this, and I think this is one of Jesus' points as he realizes that if we are unwilling to forgive someone, it will harm every relationship that we have. Because I don't, this is just me, 
I don't have enough willpower and skill to hold my emotions towards someone who has hurt me and segment that over there and treat my wife and my kids and my, sp- and my family members and my coworkers like nothing has happened. It will infect and poison every relationship that I have when I refuse to forgive someone. And the second part is this, and this is the part that I don't, I don't want to acknowledge. And this is the part that Jesus is going to get to. This is why I think he's so passionate about this. Because he's basically saying, you know the love and forgiveness that God has extended you? It's given to the person who has hurt you too. The person who you can't stand. And this part, this is the part where we try to argue with God. Like, God, trust me, they're horrible people. Like, I think they like clip their fingernails at the dinner table. They're just bad. They're horrible people. And God's like, no, 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 no. The cost that I have paid is not only for you, it is absolutely for the person who has hurt you. And that's why I think Jesus is so fired up about this. And I think this is his point. If God can forgive all sin for all time, we have the power to forgive any sin at any time. And there's a reason why I think Jesus doesn't pull any punches here, to be honest. He's got about seven months to live at this point. So every moment he can make forgiveness a big deal, he does. Peter asks this question. It seems like an innocent one. Jesus gathers everyone around. He provides several teaching points. And he he gives this punchline. God will treat you this way if you do not forgive other people. Because God is going to forgive all sin for all time. You can forgive any sin at any time. So Jesus has about seven months to live. It's a teaching moment. He realizes how powerful of a subject matter this is, that just a one-sentence answer won't do. But what I love about this story is that Jesus had every right to end this story with a command. You will forgive everyone. But he doesn't. If you notice, one of the words in there is unless. It is always a choice. Every single time, it is a choice that Jesus gives you. And what's interesting about that is that God chose. I mean, so many people think if he's a good God, he had to do something for us. He didn't have to. That's the beauty of it, is that he absolutely chose to forgive us. And here's what would happen. Seven months from now, Jesus would be on his last three days on earth. He'd be hanging around with his friends. The people he t- some of the people he told this exact parable to, and they probably remembered He's sitting down with them, and he's told this three or four times by this point. He's taught on forgiveness, but now he's going to put his money where his mouth is. He's going to show them what the cost of forgiveness is. And so he tells them, he says, hey, in about a day, I'm going to be arrested. They're going to come under cover of night. They're going to give me an illegal trial at night. They're going to cut me. They're going to beat me. I'm going to be dragged through the streets. My name is going to be dragged through the streets. And eventually, I'm going to be put up on two pieces of wood, my shame on display for the world. That's what it's going to cost me. And of course, Peter, who's sitting in there, who's like the annoying kid that always answers every question in class. You you know that? I was that kid, so I understand how this is. He's like, nope, nope, not going to do that. Peter hears Jesus say this, and and this isn't new information. Jesus has been saying this in his ministry all along. I will go to die. This is my purpose. No one takes it away from me. I give it up of my own accord. And Peter says, no, 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 no. We can't, we can't, we can't do that. What if, what if, just an idea here, Jesus, what if, what if I die? What if I, I'll lay down my life for you. This doesn't have to be this way. We've seen you do too many incredible, important things. You are too important of an individual to do this. Do not do this. And I imagine Jesus just puts his hand on his shoulder. Peter, I know you mean well, man. I'm so glad that you have this passion. You know, and Peter's just like, yeah, I do. Like, Jesus, you don't have to do this. Just step it down a notch, right? Step it down a notch. And Peter's Peter's listening to Jesus as Jesus is saying, look, you mean well, but can I play the the tape a little bit forward for you, Peter? Because when when my name is dragged through the streets, when my body that is broken and bloody I'm going to need you then. And you know where you're going to be? You're going to be hiding. People will ask if you know me, and you will say, no, I don't know the man. Not once, not twice, but three times. And Peter's like, no, I'd never do that to you, Jesus. But that's exactly what happens. 
Not too long after that, everything happens exactly as Jesus said it would. He's beaten, he's bloodied, he's put on display, which everyone thinks is a shameful thing, but that was Jesus' intention all along. He's right where he wants to be. But that's not the end of the story. Three days later, when people are going to the tomb to see a very dead Jesus, he is very much alive. And people are murmuring because people have said, you know, I've seen, I've seen him. Hundreds of people have seen them, has seen Jesus. He's alive and well, and people can't figure this out. They're like, what has happened here? And Jesus takes it upon himself to visit one particular person, Peter. He's got a conversation he has with him. And so we're so fortunate that one of the other eyewitness accounts, John, is there. And he writes down what happened. And here's what happens is Jesus talks to him, and he says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, hey, Hey, Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me more than everything else? And Peter's like, yeah, of course I do. Except for that one time when I disowned you. Can we forget about that part? Like, I'm sorry about that. And Jesus is like, no, do you love me? And he asked him a second time, hey, do you, do you really love me, Peter? Like, really? And Peter says, absolutely, I would do anything for you, Jesus. Just name it. And he gives him some instructions. Then he asks him a third time, he says, hey, Simon, son of John, I mean, do you, do you really love me? And Peter's hurt. But he's heard Jesus teach on forgiveness. I mean, and, and if, you, if you're paying attention to the story, which, which Peter probably was, is that he realizes how many times that he rejected Jesus, how many times Jesus asked him, do you love me? Now, it's not the seven that Peter had asked in his original question, how many times does it take? Because the number is irrelevant. And Jesus proved that. He said, it doesn't matter how many times because I'm going to do one thing for all time. The basis of our relationship, Peter, and he proves it by this last sentence. Then he said to him, follow me. You are absolutely accepted into my life, Peter, because of who you are and because of what I've done, not based on what you have done. And this is a powerful sentiment. Because I love this, because if you think about it, if God is so powerful, he could have died on the cross and made it so no sin ever happened for all time. Not just forgiven it. But what I think is paramount to understanding why Jesus did it this way is that because Jesus is far less interested in your past and so much more interested in your future. Because your past will not define your relationship with him. In fact, the way I put it here is that forgiveness will never change the past but it will create, and it can create, a future. Now, if all this God talk has been been difficult, and maybe you're just not there yet, I'm going to bring it down one more level, a few levels. Many of you could get on stage and sit in this chair and tell us your story. You could sit right here, and we would be so angry with you to the damage that someone has done to you. We would cry with you. Some of us would say, just give me their address. We'll go there right now. Like some of you would do that. And we'd all be heartbroken because of what has happened. But it doesn't have to stay that way. And maybe this is something you haven't realized because it is so hard to extend forgiveness to someone who has hurt us. We want no part about that. And maybe, this is just my opinion, maybe one of the things that we miss is that forgiveness is primarily for us first. Because as we said earlier, if you will not forgive someone, and again, it doesn't mean you invite them into your life. It doesn't mean you want a relationship with them. It simply means is that you will not allow the poison that is the bitterness, the hurt that comes. And when you don't forgive someone to poison every relationship that you have or will have, Because your past doesn't have to define you. In fact, forgiveness, and I'll leave you with this, was never intended to recreate the past, only to create a future. A future for you, a future for the people that you love who have hurt you, if you choose, for the person who has hurt you. And ultimately, the reason that Jesus extended forgiveness is for you to have a relationship, a future with him. Let me pray for us. Father, we're so thankful that Jesus gives us these, these difficult stories. I mean, he, he is just the master. I'm so grateful that, that he says all the hard things and we just get to, to say yes or no to it because 
he gives us grace and truth. Lord, for so many of us in here, we have absolutely pictured a person in our mind that throughout this message, when Jesus has given this story, we have thought, there's no way I can forgive that person. They have harmed me too deeply. And Lord, our hope today is to not to go back to that past and allow it to define us, but to realize forgiveness will create a future for us. And you have created a future for us uh, through your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, it's been my pleasure to share uh, your Sunday uh, uh, with you. Thank you so much for being here. I'll be in the lobby. My name is Kyle. Have a great Sunday. Peace. So